be posted on ultimately uh, it will be posted on uh, Brookland Civics website which is www.brooklandcivic.org. BNCA hosts events like this from time to time as part of fulfilling our miss mission, which besides advocacy and community building, includes providing forums like this for learning about issues affecting Brooklanders and the city at large. And you can learn more about Brookland Civic uh, the the uh, Civic Association, and you can become a member. We hope you'll become a member by going to our website Bye. at brooklandcivic.org. Uh, with that, I'm going to jump right in and introduce our moderator tonight. Uh, the moderator for tonight's forum, his name is M Mr. Michael Bryce Sadler, otherwise known as Michael from here on out. Uh, Michael is a local reporter at the Washington Post. He covers DC government and politics for the Post's Metro desk. He joined the Post in June 2018 as an intern after graduating from the University of Maryland. Before moving to cover local politics, he covered national and breaking news on the Post's general assignment desk. We're very grateful to have such a distinguished individual to moderate tonight's forum on Initiative 83. And with that, Michael, please take it away. Thanks, Caroline, and good evening, everyone. Uh, and thanks to the Brooklyn Neighborhood Civic Association for inviting me uh, and to all of our panelists for coming out to discuss Initiative 83 as Election Day uh, is just around the corner. Uh, before we dive into the initiative, let me say a few words about the run of show for tonight's program. It's going to be a very simple format. We have two panelists on opposing sides of the initiative. Each will have 10 minutes to present her case. After that, uh, we'll go to questions, which I'll ask of the panelists. Uh, these questions were not shared ahead of time, and we budget, budgeted about half an hour for the Q&A portion. If time permits, we'll take some questions from the audience, uh, and I'll indicate if there is time available for that, at which point you can raise your hand using the uh, raise hand function on Zoom. Uh, and I'll, I'll call on you. So to keep things organized, if you leave any questions in the chat, those will be forwarded from what I understand to tonight's speakers to uh, get answers to later on. So if you have a question uh, and we have time for questions, please raise your hand to get those addressed. Um, now a few words of explanation as far as Initiative 83. Um, it is on the ballot for this year's election and uh, we will screen share the actual text uh, of the ballot initiative, uh, I believe now if we can. Um, Give us a sec. Sure. Um, while Caroline's doing that, I will just talk about what this initiative will do. So uh, in essence, the first part of the initiative would uh, replace DC's current plurality based election system with a ranked choice voting system. Uh, in DC, ranked choice voting would allow voters to rank up to five candidates in the order of preference, then using a tabulation process, uh, this would eliminate candidates who get the least number of votes, and the winner is determined by which candidate gets 50% of the vote first. That's the first part of Initiative 83. The second part would replace the current requirement that, whole, um, that requires a voter, if they want to vote in a political party's primary election, to be registered with that political party. Uh, Initiative 83 would change that requirement to allow voters who are not registered with the political party to vote uh, in the primary election as an independent uh, of his or her choosing, uh, for all offices other than political party offices. Political party offices like state committee men and women, delegates to conventions and the like would not be affected by this change. Now, this was just my attempt to kind of boil the initiative down into its essence. There is of course a lot more on it that our speakers will have uh, time to uh, talk about in just a moment. Uh, so I'll let them dive into what the initiative will and won't achieve, uh, but I'll introduce them first. So on the yes side of initiative 83, uh, we have Bri Brianna uh, McGowan representing Make All Votes Count DC. Uh, Bri, as she is called, is a former uh, Edgewood Ward 5 resident. Uh, she recently co-bought a home with friends in Ward 4. She is co-director for both Women Who Code DC and Delicious Democracy, DC's creative advocacy lab. Oh, she, wow. is a yeah. she is a developer, poet, data okay. scientist, modern dancer. Okay, okay. For 
<laughs> an advocate for equitable transformations to DC's power system, starting with passing ranked choice voting and laying the groundwork for black independent political power. She is passionate about intersecting worlds, developing community owned AI, centering delicious food and building a future DC state. She is a steering committee member of Yes on 83 and DC for Democracy and the co-founder of Read Delicious DC, a food co-op based at the Edgewood Community Farm in Ward 5. On the No to Initiative 83 side, we have Deirdre Brown representing Vote No on Initiative 83. Deirdre is a third generation Washingtonian, uh, a parent, a housing advocate, and small business owner. She's a former ANC commissioner for 3F04 and a Ward 3 Democratic Party precinct delegate and a war, former Ward 3 council candidate. She is active in local organizations advocating for women and children. Deirdre serves as legislative committee co-chair of the Metropolitan Women's Democratic Club and is a Ward 3 PLE board member for PAVE DC. She earned her Juris Doctorate from UDC's David A. Clark School of Law. She was raised, uh, she's raised five children in the district and currently resides in the Palisades neighborhood of Ward 3. So with that, I'm gonna give each speaker 10 minutes to present their side of this key issue. The Brooklyn Neighborhood Civic Association will enable screen sharing for PowerPoint presentations and documents. Uh, and in my own democratic effort, I flipped the coin before we started to determine who would go first. Uh, Bree, you were heads and Deirdre, you were tails. Heads did win. Uh, so Bree, you're going to start us off. Uh, once your presentation is loaded, you can begin. Uh, I'm gonna start a timer for 10 minutes once you get started and I'll let you know um, if you're you know, going over time or anything like that. Okay, that sounds good. Good evening, everyone. Oh, <laughs> I see my face, so let's hide that. Um, okay, sharing. Can everyone see my screen? It should be a large yes on 83. I can't. Good. Oh, okay. All right. I'm almost ready, Michael. Yeah, sure. Just let me know. Okay. I'm good. Cool. Take it away. So, hi, everyone. My name is Brianna McGowan. I go by Bree. I'm a worker owner of a Ward 5 business, former steering committee member of the Ward 5 Education Equity Committee with deep roots in Ward 5. It's a pleasure to be here talking to the Brooklyn Civic Association and to make the case for voting yes on 83 and what it means for DC. Uh, this initiative is personal for me. I have been on the ground for five years, talking to neighbors, walking up and down MLK Avenue and Anacostia to hear from those who've been forgotten in our current system and discuss ideas on how to make our systems better here in DC. What I heard was they don't come over here. They don't care about us. We are ignored. It's just the same old thing with a new face. The conversations changed when I asked, what if we change the game? What's possible? And that's how this whole grassroots movement started. A few people asking questions to see what's possible. And over the last half decade, so I started when I was 22, I'm now 28. We've laid the foundations for what has become Initiative 83. So I hope to do some basic uh -huh around the initiative, address concerns, speak my truth, and lead with my heart. So let's get into it. What is Initiative 83? Uh, what would it do for DC? It would make politicians work harder for our votes, doing two things. One, letting independents vote in the primary elections. More than 75,000 of our neighbors cannot vote in DC's taxpayer-funded primary elections, our most important elections. One in six DC voters is a registered independent. And Initiative 83 does not allow Republicans to vote in the Democratic Party or vice versa. Who is an independent in DC? Military, government workers, journalists, and also young people disappointed with our system. More and more young people are registering as independent who feel put off by a current system. So it's helpful to have a conversation around, well, how can we make the system better? Also, a lot of young people don't even know that they're independents because in DC, that is the default to be an independent. When you go to get your driver's license and you press next, 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 and get your license, you actually fail to register with the party. So in that young person who did not register with the party when they got their license shows up to vote, they are turned away from the primary system, from the primary election. You have up to three weeks, I believe, to change your registration here in DC. I'm saying, what is the difference of 21 days? Don't turn anyone away. And two, ranked choice voting. Why? Um, in our current system, 20% of 
uh, people can win with 20%, 30% of the vote. That means that 70%, 80% of the people who showed up to vote did not vote for the person who won. With ranked choice voting, it is a proven system where candidates can only win when they get over 50% of the vote. This makes it easier to hold them accountable and requires them to compete for your second and third choices. It works by you vote for your favorite candidate. You can rank your backup choices if you'd like. If your favorite cannot win or get a majority of the vote, your vote counts to your next choice and it keeps going until a candidate gets over 50% over 50 of the vote. And how many of you have seen a council race with 10 to 15 people running for a seat? We have to do this mental gymnastics of trying to determine who is the most electable. We have fear of splitting the vote and spoiler candidates, telling candidates to even drop out, vote shaming and voter apathy because there are real DC Democratic Party divisions between moderates and progressives. And we've got crowded primaries producing non-majority candidates. In our current system, a candidate can win with 20% of the vote with no incentive to be held accountable to the 80% of voters who, not, who do not vote for them. It is well tested and used across the country. Over 50 cities and municipalities use ranked choice voting. Here in, uh, there in Santa Fe, Minneapolis, over 99% of ballots were valid. Um, people think it's easy and people rank more than two choices. It does not benefit a particular ideology, but it does increase the chances of less electable and grassroots candidates to win. And also women and women of color win and run more in ranked elections. So who are we? Our proposer is an ANC in Ward 7 and a DCPS, the mom of a DCPS Ward 8 teacher. And our treasurer, Philip Pinnell, is the executive director of the Anacostia Coordinating Council and also a five-time president and co-founder of the Ward 8 Democrats. I'm going to address some of the no 183 claims that have been made in previous debates. So Democrats don't like this, but we have shown that this is a national movement where Democrat supporters are supporting ranked choice voting. Jamie Raskin, a Maryland congressman, Maya Wiley, a New York City mayoral candidate who lost and still went on a campaign explaining why she still supports ranked choice voting as a better system. Mary Poltola, Alaskan Congresswoman, and Tim Walls, our Vice President nominee for the Democratic uh, ticket. And these are who leading the anti rc movement nationally. There are efforts to limit ranked choice voting that are being led by the Heritage Foundation, which is behind Project 2025 and other right-wing groups that are spreading myth of voter fraud and stop the steal, attacking DC statehood and the Voting Rights Act, and instituting strict voter ID laws across the country I think it's a shame that the local Democratic insiders are taking the same side of the issue as these vote suppressors. You may also hear my opponent mention 10 states that have banned ranked choice voting. So these are the 10 Republican-led states, none of which have ever used ranked choice voting. Voting right-wing groups like the Heritage Foundation are pushing these preemptive bans of ranked choice voting in the deepest ruby red states in the country. So why are the DC Democratic Party insiders celebrating that and following suit? The DC Republican Party has come out against ranked choice voting and it has come to my attention that the treasurer of the No 183 campaign is a registered Republican who lives in Maryland. You may also hear that ballots will be eliminated in ranked choice voting. By our opponent standards, 56% of these ballots were eliminated under our current system, anyone who didn't vote for Felder or Payne. With ranked choice voting, you can rank, you can rank a long shot first and still weigh in between your top two candidates. So let's bring it back to DC because this is that's all all of that is a distraction. What this is about is making politicians work harder for our vote. This is our coalition. We hit the ground running about a year ago and gathered over 40,000 signatures in the span of six months with having over 100,000 conversations in the streets. These are the organizations who support us like DC for Democracy, League of Women Voters DC, Sunrise DC, We Act Radio. These are the businesses who support us like Busboys and Poets, Everyday Sunday, Mintwood Strategies. And we've also gotten the endorsement from the Washington Post editorial board. And over 50 ANC commissioners, which are, which are hyper-local representatives here in DC across all eight wards. Our movement shows that people are ready for a change and this isn't gonna solve all of our problems. Nothing is a silver bullet, but I believe it's a step in the right direction. So I encourage you all to join me and make politicians work harder for our votes. And remember to vote by November 5th. Yes, and 83 will be on the back of your ballot to let independents vote in the primaries 
And to be able to rank your backup choices to make politicians have to represent and be accountable to the majority of us. Um, again, I, I believe in a system that should work for most of us. And I hope that um, if when, you know, once I talk here tonight to y'all, that y'all will be listening to both sides um, and yeah, make up your minds and at the end of the day, let the voters decide. Thank you. Thanks, Bree. So next we're gonna be hearing from uh, Deirdre on the no to I-83 side of things. Uh, if uh, we can get her presentation going. Okay, let me see if I can share my screen. Let's see. There we go. Looks good. Okay. Thank you. All right, you'll have 10 minutes to go, so uh, please take it away. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Deirdre Brown, the chair of Vote No and Initiative 83. And today I'm going to speak to you about the myths and facts concerning Initiative 83. So what is Initiative 83? If Initiative 83 is successful, it would change the way elections are held in the district. It would allow for ranked choice voting, also known as instant runoffs, and it would allow for semi-closed primaries. In other words, it would allow for independents to vote in the primary elections. Vote No and Initiative 83 is a grassroots campaign formed in part to educate the public about the facts and myths around ranked choice voting and semi-closed primaries. I'm sure you've seen the signs and heard the slogan, make all votes count. This sounds great, but is a false statement created to confuse and mislead the average voter. In our current system, all votes are counted. However, in a ranked choice voting system, also known as the instant runoff system, many votes will be discarded and not counted. Votes are eliminated. As noted in Mark Fisher's September 11, 2024 Washington Post article, the Post Law is 2,326 pages, words long and includes 11 definitions. I'm going to assume most of you have not read it, so let me explain it to you in plain language. These are screenshots from the actual initiative, ballot initiative. I want to also be clear that Board of Elections did not write this language, make all votes count submitted this language for the board election to accept as is. So this is their proposal. How it works is that you rank up to five candidates, even if you don't know anything about the candidate or have any strong feelings one way or another about the candidate. According to the definition section of the proposed law, which you're looking at here, votes are eliminated where there's deemed to be an inactive ballot and are not counted. An inactive ballot means a ballot in which there's an overvote, undervote, or skip vote. If there's a tie, there will be a random drawing via cast lot where one candidate is eliminated randomly to break the tie. So we go to this page here. You'll see here it says that any round of tabulation in a contest conducted by ranked choice voting, an inactive ballot should not be counted for any candidate, and an undervote should not be counted for any candidate. The following paragraph goes through how they do a cast lot based on random drawing to determine to break a tie. Basically, if the voter gives more than one candidate the same ranking, ranks a candidate more than once, or skips a ranking, their ballot is eliminated. If two candidates are tied, one ballot is randomly eliminated. Exhausted ballots in ranked choice voting elections do not count towards the final tally either. While many ranked choice voting ballots are thrown out due to voter error and fall in convoluted um, instructions, ballots that follow instructions to the letter can also be thrown away because the voter ranked candidates who are no longer in contention. As candidates are eliminated through multiple rounds of tabulations, voters have their ballots exhausted. They only rank candidates that have been removed during successive rounds. Elections as they are today are about choosing the candidate of your choice, the one that shares your values, and as long as you do that, your vote is counted. With ranked choice voting, if you make a mistake on ranking your five preferences from who you like the most to who you like the least, your ballot could become inactive or exhausted. Ranked choice voting eliminates and suppresses votes. Here are the results from the 2023 Allerton County Primary County Board election. They use ranked choice voting. A brief glance at the data proves ranked choice voting is completely unfair and undemocratic, even when all the candidates had the same party affiliation. Notice how in this race for two board seat nominations, Maureen Coffey, the wo woman who would have finished third in a normal primary, 
was able to announce victory before, before Susan Cunningham, the woman who received the most first place votes. More importantly, recognize that Landley Rowe was eliminated despite having more first place votes than Coffee. Rowe also held leads over Coffee in rounds two and three, yet still went home empty handed. Because of ballot exhaustion, winners of ranked choice voting races do not necessarily represent the choice of the voters who participated. Ranked choice voting claims to promote the majority of votes, but in reality, ranked choice voting creates an artificial majority because the winner may have 50% of the votes after rounds of eliminations, but not the majority of the votes of the votes cast. Beyond being confusing, voters can become frustrated and disillusioned when candidates with fewer first choice votes prevail. So whose votes are historically eliminated? Yep. Choice voting research shows that when asked to rank three candidates, the ability to accurately do so was lowest among African-Americans, Hispanics, and those whose first language is not English. Ranked choice voting suppresses and eliminates the counting of black and brown votes. It has been shown that ranked choice voting suppresses the votes of seniors and those who with disabilities. Ranked choice voting studies show that seniors or persons with disability are more likely to have their ballots discarded due to undervoting and un overvoting. An academic study out of the University of Minnesota concluded that ranked choice voting favors white voters and their affluent who turn out at a higher rate, completed their ballots more accurately, and were more likely to use all the opportunities to rank their most preferred candidates compared to voters living in lower income neighborhoods and in communities of color. Many states, cities, and counties now regret having implemented ranked choice voting and have or are in the process of repealing it, citing that ranked choice voting is a confusing and convoluted method of voting. In addition, this system has resulted in thousands of discarded ballots, widespread voter errors, delayed election results, suspect recounts, and consequently diminished voter confidence. We know that public trust in election matters. This is why the 10 states noted on the screen here have banned ranked choice voting over the last two years. Ranked choice is approved at the statewide level only in Maine and Alaska. However, in Alaska on this November's ballot, there is a measure aimed at repealing the 2020 voter initiative to replace party, party primaries with open primaries and instituted ranked choice voting. It took only one statewide ranked choice election for citizens to begin circulating petitions to get rid of the measure. Alaskans' reasons for rejecting ranked choice voting are numerous. To start, 11% of the ballots in Alaska in 2022 were spoiled due to voter confusion under ranked choice voting system, more than three times the normal rate. During the state special at large congressional election, nearly 15,000 Alaskans had their ballots thrown out. This included more than 11,000 tossed because vo voters selected only one candidate without ranking any others. When the candidates were eliminated, their votes were eliminated as well. The second part of Initiative 83 is the semi-closed primary part. The biggest myth is that closed primaries disenfranchise independent voters. All eligible voters can vote in the general election and can vote in the primary if they are registered with a party, Democratic Party, Republican Party, or Green Party. If you are not registered with a recognized party, you are considered unaffiliated or independent. The proponent said that you have to do it 21 days beforehand. That is not a true statement. You can walk into any polling place on the day of election and change your party affiliation and or register vote in the District of Columbia. Let's remember that primary elections are nomination elections. This is when political parties pick the part candidate that will represent their party in the general election. This is the candidate that shares their values and their platform. Under the Home Rule Act, primary elections in the district are partisan. Political parties in the district have the right to pick who have who they want to represent them in the general election. There's no interest fee or criteria to register with a party, but if you are not registered with a particular party, you do not get to pick their candidates, just like any other club or association that you belong to. Only registered members are allowed to vote. Non-members do not get to vote in your elections. This is just an attempt to meddle in nomination elections by letting nonpartisan voters influence the outcome of primary elections. But let's follow the money. Local proponents of I-83 present a local face under the banner, Make All Votes Count. However, a look at campaign finance reports show that efforts are largely driven by outside special interest groups. These groups are not based in D.C., but represent outside interests seeking to influence D.C. politics. Fair Vote Action Pack has donated over $120,000, and California-based All One God Faith, Inc. has contributed over $280,000. The combined donations of these two organizations equals 82% of the funds that 
make all votes counts has collected. 68% has come from out-of-state corporations, 22% have come from out-of-state PACs, 6% have come from out-of-state individuals, and only 3% have come from D.C. donors. Why are these non-district groups so interested in our elections? Who, why are outside entities hiding behind local faces? We believe this is a blatant attack by outside money in an attempt to push a national agenda of voter suppression to reshape who our elected officials are and what they look like. I'm down to one minute, so I'm just going to skip ahead here. Why should you vote no on Initiative 83? One, ranked choice voting is, is instant runoffs, which is designed to suppress the Black vote, and as discussed, it has been shown to suppress and eliminate the votes of people of color, seniors, low income, and persons with disability. Two, it violates the belief that small grassroots donors should have power in elections and not corporate interests. The opponents are funded by outside corporate interest PACs and non-district donors. Three, Allow independent voters to vote in partisan nomination elections without having to party register is a violation of the Home Rule Act and therefore violates your commitment to D.C. statehood efforts and your understanding that D.C. statehood is a matter of racial justice. An attack on Home Rule is an attack on D.C. statehood. We will stop letting ranked choice voting spurs people tell us that the only solution is to implement bad election reform. Challenge them with everything you've seen here tonight. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Deirdre. That was uh, perfect as far as time. So thanks for staying in 10 minutes. And thanks to both of you for uh, presenting. Um, so I'll just take it away with some questions. Uh, and like I said, if we have time toward the end, I will uh, let people raise their hand for questions as well. But I'll, I'll stick with this notion of the Home Rule uh, Charter. And Bree, I wanted to give you a chance to respond uh, to this notion that this is something that uh, would be in violation of, of home rule, uh, which notes that primaries uh, have partisan contests uh, as far as opening up primaries to independent voters. What do you say in response to the um, argument there? Yeah. So in order for us to have been even uh, proper, you know, like to, to be considered a ballot initiative in D.C., we had to um, meet these different tests in order to be a ballot initiative. One of them is it cannot vote the home rule. And so ranked choice voting and letting independents vote in the primaries was found that it does not violate the Home Rule Act because it still we still will have partisan primaries in the District of Columbia. Uh, Deirdre, I'll give you a chance to respond to that. Uh, obviously, this is something that's being challenged by the DC Democratic Party in court. Uh, can you explain you know, why you believe this is a violation of the Home Rule Act considering uh, the language was passed by the Board of Elections. So they're they're mixing apples and oranges as usual because this is what they do in their propaganda campaign. Um, the Board of Elections said that they were appropriate to be um, an initiative. And that was based on, they had criteria that you have to follow. One of which, the one is highly contested is um, initiative, ballot initiatives cannot appropriate funds, right? Um, the initiative, when it originally was put in, it was a physical impact statement that said it appropriated funds. Um, they then, the make all votes count people, removed that initiative. Um, at some point, they had gotten an opinion letter from the attorney general's office that said if they added a sentence that is subject to appropriations, that um, it would pass that test. They added that language and put it back in. This is part of why it's being challenged. It does violate the Home Rule Act, which is something totally different for whether it was appropriate, um, the BOE says it was appropriate to be on the ballot. It violates the Home Rule Act because our Home Rule Act clearly states that our um, elections are partisan. And what this legislation, this initiative rather, tries to do is circumvent that by adding language that would change how um, the Home Rule Act would um, be implemented. Thank you. Um... Bree, I also have a question for you along those lines. Um, with the funds that would need to be appropriated by the DC Council if this initiative passes, uh, and I'm sure you've seen, and for those who don't know, the DC Council has had a very mixed reaction so far as um, as far as their support for this initiative. Some are split, uh, some are for it, and some haven't shared their opinion. So uh, if this does pass and this is in the Council's hands, uh, what does the campaign look like for uh, the pro initiative eighty three side after uh, it passes, so to speak. What do you what do you say to the council at that point? 
Yeah. Um, well, my headspace is <laughs> let's pass this um, coming election, but that is a great question. So what does it look like if it does pass? Um, it is asking council members, will they honor the will of the vote, the will of the people? If it passes with a majority of the vote and a council member decides to slice and dice it when it comes to funding it, I think that is a deep political mistake because what, because what that means is that it's another um, effort, another proof that shows that council members can um, do things that are deeply unpopular. And so that's why we're wanting to have this initiative to make them work harder for our votes and be held accountable to the majority of us and also to honor the will of the people by fully funding this initiative. Um, it is possible for them to decide which pieces to fund and not fund, and that is a whole separate fight. But I do think that would be a deep political mistake for a council member to take that action and not honor the will of the people. Uh, Deirdre, I wanna ask you the same question. Should this initiative pass, what does this campaign look like for the vote no uh, for initiative 83 side? Well, we're already seeing that there, you, you can hear it in her language. It would be political, what should say, uh, political, uh, whatever for them or whatever. So we're already seeing this bullying, right? In the media, in their language, the council, if you don't appropriate funds to this, we're going to come after you. It's going to be polit politically bad for you. Instead of looking at this as a situation where each councilman will need to look at who in their wards voted and didn't vote for this, and we'll need to see how it affects the people in their wards um, on the ground, right? Because we already know that we have a high number of overvoting, undervoting in certain wards already. We know that certain wards don't um, aren't represented and their voices aren't heard. And so if you're the council member for those wards, you need to be looking out for who your residents are and not worrying about these organizations with all this outside money coming in and bullying you and trying to make you appropriate funds that one we don't even have like that's let's go there with that when we just finished having a budget where we were fighting over whether we was going to give people food and housing and, and educate our children so uh so that that's another piece of this um it may not be appropriated because we might not just have it to give because this is not a priority this is a something that special interest groups who don't live here in the district are pushing on us Thank you. Um, Bri, I wanted to ask, um, and I received this question uh, from someone ahead of this forum. I thought it was an interesting one, um, considering the strains on the city's budget right now. And I don't know if you have the figure handy as far as what the uh, CFO estimated this would cost. Um, I, I might have been in the realm of um, a few million or four million. I can't yeah. remember, but I'll let you say it again. It'll be a little over a million dollars over four years. Oh, I don't hear you, Brett. Uh, Michael. Yeah, I accidentally muted myself. Um, so what would you say to the argument that maybe DC's money is better spent on more pressing issues considering the budget cycle uh, we just had? Well, I think that ballot initiatives, what makes them so powerful is that they're, it's a people pass legislation. So what that means is, and um, I, I agree with Deidre that a council member should look at the different wards and you know see literally how their constituents voted. Our hope is that a lot of people will be in support of this. And what this means is that that should be a signal to honor the will of the people and um, prioritize it because it is a people passed legislation. I think that the idea of like, oh, this isn't a priority is kind of missing the mark because it's showing that people are ready for a better system. And I'm gonna break it down just a little bit because we have a $20 billion budget in DC. We're practically operating at the same finance levels as other states. And I would like us to start acting like a state by being able to do things that are bold steps. And so $20 billion budget and a 13 member council that means that each council member has over a billion dollars worth of power. And that's where it comes down to is who you who wins in your election in the elections is determining how much funding DCPS gets. It's determining how much SNAP is going to get. 
It's determining how many housing vouchers are going to go out there. And so I do think it is like this fundamental issue where if the if the person who is in office is not held accountable to my, by the majority of us, what is the incentive to to care for people who have been left out and shut out for far too long? I also want to say that this is something where we rank our choices every day. People who um, have submitted a, a application for a housing voucher have ranked their preferences on where to live. Parents who send their kids to public schools in DC have ranked their preferences of schools in order um, to where to send their kid to school. So this is something that is intuitive, it's natural. We already use this in DC. And so I think when it comes to, should they prioritize if this isn't a priority, where is it gonna be in the budget? It's showing that, hey, we will prioritize this because the people have shown resoundingly that they're ready for a change and to work harder for people's votes to be held accountable by the majority of the people. That's what it's about. Thank you for that response. Um... If I could stick with you, Bree, um, what was the rationale? And I think this is something a lot of people aren't quite sure about for uh, combining two of these, uh, me I won't say combining two measures together, but certainly two uh, election reforms together in one initiative, uh, especially when you consider the fact that there are some people who say, I do support RCV and don't support open primaries or vice versa. Uh, and what should those folks do? if they are feeling that way. Yeah, um, so why combine them? We combine them because I think that together they are a step in the right direction. Um, one part of the initiative is about expanding the electorate by allowing independents who currently pay for our taxpayer funded elections to be able to vote in them. Um, and then the second part is by allowing more choice and more voice in our current system. Um, it's about expanding and strengthening our democracy. And if people are on the fence, so they like one part of the initiative, but not the other, I think there's something to say that both of them can mean that we are taking measures to reduce voter suppression in DC and to expand the electorate. And it also means stronger um, candidates. So who win to represent the majority of us. So if you are on the fence and you feel that one of these you're not really down with, I encourage you to think about when are, when are we gonna have another time to change the system? Say that you're interested in ranked choice voting, but maybe not opening the primaries to independents. Well, I would say to still vote yes, and then maybe be a part of the conversation like Michael was getting at after implementation around what pieces you would like to see funded. And that could be what you uh, the fight that you take up. But there's also something to be said about other reforms. And I would love to consider other things as well, but right now this is what's on the ballot. And this is, in my opinion, uh, a step in the right direction. Thank you. Uh, Deirdre, roughly 76,000 DC voters are registered independents and under DC's current system, if they want to vote in a primary election, they need to register with a political party. Uh, open primary supporters argue that since public taxpayer resources are paying for primary elections and uh, Bree just made this point, uh, they should be able to participate in them. Uh, so what do you say in response to that argument? All right, first, I'm going to go back to the question you asked her because you didn't give me a chance to respond to that. They combined this because they didn't think that they were going to get any pushback. Uh, they thought that they were going to come in here and try to undermine, fundamentally undermine our whole rule act and no one was going to pay attention and no one's going to push back. When you vote yes or no on your ballot, you're voting for both. This idea that afterwards we can have a conversation about it is don't be fooled by that. That's not a true statement. When you vote, you're voting yes to both or you're voting no to both. Okay, so let's be really clear about what you're voting on. Um, as far as the taxpayer part, listen, as she said in her presentation, most of the people who are registered as independent are registered because they do not believe in any of the three parties. Right, they don't believe in those values or 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 what the party platform stand for. Lisa Rice Raposa has stood up multiple times in the last nine months and said just that. She used to be a Democrat. She's not anymore because she doesn't believe in the party values. 
primary elections are when the parties pick their candidates, the one who represents their values and the one who represents their platform to be put up at the general elections. Independents can register as in any of the three parties, Green Party, Republican Party, or Democratic Party, up to and on the day of elections, if that's what they wanted to do. If you don't like how our electoral system is as it stands, there is a proper legislative way to go about trying to change the home rule. The problem is that the home rule is the only small sliver, that, if you know DC history, and I think some of these folks, these outside folks don't, small sliver we fought to get in order that we have some control over our electoral system and have some control over who our elected officials are. When they keep using this dog whistle change, 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 what are we changing? We have a council that is diverse in women and in people of color. We've had uh, mayors, who, uh, executive office been diverse in both. So what are you trying to change it to? It makes me think you're trying to change it to what we don't, to look like what we look the opposite of what we have now, okay? So we that's not what we want. As far as the... Um, she said, keeps keep saying, um, making a politician accountable. Listen, I can tell you right now, there's nobody who runs for office who doesn't work hard to get a vote. When you're staying out there getting petitions, when you're not door knocking, when you're at meeting greets, no one's walking around with a badge that says I'm independent, I'm Republican, or whatever. You're just a resident. You might not even be a voter because a lot of times we're talking to people and then they go, oh, well, I'm not registered to vote or I live in Maryland. But you're still talking to everyone. This idea that politicians only talk to a small group doesn't make sense. That's not how people campaign. Now, if you don't like who is in the Wilson building, I can tell you some folks in the Wilson building I, I don't I don't think should be there, then run someone against them, right? But ranked choice voting and semi-closed primaries is not going to fix that problem. So uh, if not open primaries, what do you tell, uh, and I'm sticking with you, uh, Deidre, independent voters who do want a more meaningful say in D.C.'s election without perhaps making a choice that compromises their values by switching to a party they don't fully believe in? Yeah, unfortunately, our Home Rule Act clearly states to independents um, that our primaries are partisan, right? So you have to belong to a party to order to vote in the primary. Like, so they can only vote in the general election. Um, they can run. We do have a couple of independents who do run. Um, you can run independent voters. I mean, the same money you dump in behind uh, this initiative, you could put behind your candidates you feel are going to represent you better. Um, but changing the Home Rule Act um, is not the answer. Thank you. I'm going to keep it moving. Um, definitely an interesting conversation going on. Um, yeah, actually, I wanted to ask you uh, about one of the arguments I hear a lot when it comes to RCV is that um, the confusion would um, be extra harmful to those um, marginalized groups you talked about, I think seniors, uh, dis disabled, disabled folks, uh, and Black residents. Um, and there are already issues with uh, undercounting, especially uh, when it comes to at-large races where voters can already select two candidates. Uh, the response to that I hear often is that a more robust voter education campaign can help anyone learn uh, what the new system looks like and that we're not giving people enough credit for uh, the change they could accommodate. So what would you say to that uh, argument? So, um, oh, and I, I'm sorry, I should have also, in the last one I've got to say, so this um, the physical impact statement numbers she gave you were incorrect, uh, is 1.2 million in the first year. Um, you can find the physical impact statement letter on our website, votenow83.com forward slash facts. Um, so it was 1.2 million in the first year, um, not over the five years. So in part of that, a large chunk of that is supposed to go to voter education, right? So part, part of that's going to go to um, BOE having to get new software, new systems, that kind of stuff. Um, but part is supposed to go to voter education. Here's what I say to that. In a utopia, that would work. But we know that right now, when you look at certain wards, uh, the high number of undervote and overvote, because BOE does publish those numbers every time we have an election, you go to their website and do a ward search for the results, and they'll tell you right at the bottom what the undervote and overvote are. And the numbers are significantly higher than they are in certain wards, right? And that's with BOE doing their voter outreach and education. Um, they just finished um, testifying before the council on all the voter outreach and education they've been doing since last, you know, January. And we still have that. So the idea that 
we're going to be able to stop that from happening, having large amount of ballots become inactive because of overvote, undervoting, or skip voting, um, relying on BOE to be able to educate people. That's just not going to happen. And what we're going to see is what a lot of states have seen is that certain votes are suppressed. And those are going to be the votes of our most vulnerable and marginalized communities. Thanks, Deirdre. Bree, I wanted to give you a chance to respond to uh, this voter education component and uh, particularly this idea that marginalized voters who maybe are already underrepresented in our elections for uh, one reason or another, that problem could be exacerbated uh, if this initiative passed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, I have a couple points. Um, the first is um, um, my opponent sounds like she's someone who has won our current system and is blinded by how it isn't working for a lot of people. Um, so there is a point about a diverse council. And I agree, we do have a diverse council. And some of the champions of diversity on our council actually support ranked choice voting. Um, but we cannot rely on that system working forever. We are facing like unprecedented levels of gentrification and displacement of chocolate city. And so ranked choice voting means voters can build a broad coalition and vote in solidarity together. If someone has a champion, say a black champion east of the river who they feel really represents them and then their neighbor feels like, oh, well, I have this other person who I think represents me better. They can actually form an alliance and say, okay, well, I'll vote for your person second. And that way they can build that power together and preserve black voting power in DC in the face of unprecedented levels of gentrification and displacement. I also wanna say that we have a diverse council, but we have not had a Latina or Latino council member on DC, even though they make up over, I think, 12% of the population. So I do think that is a bit tone deaf. And I also want to say that seniors and um, people who are low income, low education, like all of that is so insulting. When I talk to people on the streets, I'm on the streets every day. I have been for about five years talking to people about these ideas, especially I prioritize East of the River because I know that is where people are feeling really left out. And that is kind of, in my opinion, the last bastion of Chocolate City. And people get it. It's easy. People rank their choices every day. So I find it deeply insulting to make those claims. I want to say, I also want to say that um, these new systems is going to cost so much money, blah, blah, blah. The systems, so Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center has free software. It's open source and other cities and municipalities use their free software. The um, voting uh, booths in DC that are, um, are able to be compatible with this software. So if implemented, that would be an actual free upgrade. And then I, I'm gonna talk about like educating voters. Um, so this is where I believe, um, I think would have the most powerful education for ranked choice voting. And if I were, you know, if passed, I would really push on how to go about the strategy of educating voters. So I would say continuous teach-ins and workshops for our ranked choice voting education, training ambassadors and trusted leaders and people in solidarity to advocate in their respective wards and communities, and tabling, talking to people, meeting people where they are at laundromats, bus stops, barbershops, grocery stores, farmers markets, recreation centers, voting locations and other places where people spend time standing in line, hanging out and gathering. Um, Go-go events where attendees can rank options for the next songs, canvassing at public events and festivals, parks, public spaces, collaborating with uh, grassroots organizations at recurring meetings like the Brooklyn Civic Association. Um, knock and okay, what I think is the most powerful thing to do and what I have seen to be extremely effective is just knocking on every door and engaging with people face to face about what they want, what they need and asking questions, coming to people curious. Because what I have heard is people are ready for a change and people, you just can't say vote to people who are apathetic to our current system. You say, well, what will make you participate again? And that's what Yes on 83 is about. Thank you. Thanks, Bree. And I wanted to uh, follow up with you on a criticism uh, Deirdre raised earlier about the outside spending uh, when it comes to this initiative. 
Uh, so my colleague, Megan Flynn, recently reported that the pro IED3 campaign uh, had received half a million from national organizations that support RCB across the country. Uh, national groups, as you know, have also influenced previous DC ballot initiatives. And in my time reporting on the city, there has been skepticism uh, that maybe folks are using DC as a testing ground for new ideas, or that this is not truly, the, an initiative like this is not truly reflective of what residents want uh, versus what these larger organizations want. So what do you say in response to uh, Deirdre and when you hear that type of criticism maybe out in the field? Is that to me? Yes, yeah, sorry, Brie, that's to you. Okay, I want to make sure it wasn't to you. Okay, so um, yeah, I would say that the campaign is led by Washingtonians like Lisa Rice, native Washingtonian, and Philip Pinnell, longtime um, Democrat, east of the river. We have over 145 individual DC donors, which is nine times more than the No on 83 campaign. And we've received, so yes, we have received funding from Fair Vote Action, which is a group in Silver Spring that's been supporting ranked choice voting for 30 years, and from Dr. Bronner's Soap Company. Um, which is a black owned soap company whose social action office is headquartered in DC, who are people who have been in DC and part of ballot initiatives for over a decade. They have supported uh, local democracy, ranked choice voting, and they help organize grassroots ballot initiative campaigns like ours. Um, they support us because we support electoral reform and it's that simple. And so for talking about outside organizations, I really want to bring it back to this. Let's talk about how No One 83 shares its positions and talking points with the authors of Project 2025. So yes, the literal author of the elections section of Project 2025 is one of the nation's leading spokespeople against ranked choice voting. Nationally, efforts to limit ranked choice voting are being led again by this Heritage Foundation because they are behind Project 2025 and other right-wing groups. So I want to bring it back to, I think it is a shame that local Democratic leaders, insiders, um, are taking the same side of that issue as these Republican vote suppressors. Thanks, Preet. Deirdre, I want to give you a chance to respond uh, to that. Yeah, I'll do the Republican part last. Let, let's get to the facts, because that's just... And, um, yes, yeah. before you go, I want to say we have um, five minutes, so okay. if you can try to be as succinct as possible, I can squeeze in a couple more questions. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. But you gave her opportunity to do this long diatribe. Of course. So I'm going to answer what she said, okay? I'm going to address it. Um, gentrification and displacement. So and what she said was presence of the Black voice, and they want to change that. C correct. They want to change that. We have the Black voice presence of women and, and Blacks, people of color on the council and at the mayor's office, if you look at the history of the mayor. And they are definitely, so once again, you got to listen to the words that they're saying. They're not hiding their mission. They want to change that. They use the word change every other sentence. I do not know why there has not been a Latino on the, on the council. Maybe they need to, maybe a Latino could win, but ranked choice voting is not going to make a Latino win or not win, Right. Um, the idea that uh, this is the story that they're selling to Latinos is if you do ranked choice voting, we're going to make sure you get on the council. I, it's more it's not it's more um, complex than that about how people vote and who they vote for. Um, the software that she talked about is not free. Once again, another lie. The physical impact statement actually outlines exactly how much the software will cost. And in addition, what we haven't discussed is that there will be delay in the count of the votes. So as um, Michael has said earlier, if you, when you have a multi-race, more than three people, ranked choice voting kicks in. If the first person who, uh, at the, whoever comes out first doesn't have more than 50% of the vote, they then start to do a tabulation based on second, third, fourth choices. Because we do allow for mail-in ballots to be counted up to 10 to 15 days after the election, that means some results, our multi-candidate results, which think back for those of you who vote frequently, how many of our candidate um, elections have more than three people in it. That means if that per first person didn't get more than 51%, we got to wait for those ballots to come in so BOE can do their count. So we're going to have delays in our um, county. Uh, once again, they always use the rank housing, you know, people who rank housing, people who rank um, their school choices. Listen, I'm a parent of five. I have ranked the school choices before, and anyone who has done that will tell you that it is complicated. Um, but here's what happens. If I get it wrong, they don't say my kids don't get to go to school. If you get it wrong, you overvote, undervote, or skip a vote, your vote is not counted by the legislation they put in. 
as far as they're saying, oh, we're going to educate the people. We're going to educate the people. We're going to make sure they understand. Let me ask you this question. How many of you who got on this call tonight knew what ranked choice voting was and how it works? How are many of you, even after I spoke about it and after Bria spoke about it, think you have a firm grasp on how ranked choice voting works? Okay, so this idea that they're going to educate the people so to make sure that us, people who look like me and you, actually are able to have our votes counted is false. That's not going to happen. Lastly, <laughs> I am loving over the last two weeks, they're now trying to say that first, uh, Phil Pinnell two weeks ago said that we were with the Republican Party. He tried to call me a Republican. Like that, listen, don't listen to that. But I will say this, Bree, and I need to make sure because I think Lisa Rice and a couple of people on, be careful. Because it's one thing to say you think I am playing into Republicans. It's another to say what you just said on tape. The vote no is um, is in with um, the author of Project 25, 2025 and Heritage. You're moving into liable situation here. Watch your language. Okay, we're not Republicans. We are not working with Project 2025. We're not working with the Heritage Foundation. We are concerned citizens who are very concerned about what will happen if we allow you guys and your outside influences to come into this city and change our electoral system. Thank you. Thanks, Deirdre. And uh, I think I'm just gonna end on one question for each of you, uh, which is the same. Um, if Initiative 83 is enacted, uh, what effect do you think it will have on either encouraging or discouraging voters to participate? Uh, Bri, I'll let you start and then Deirdre, I'll let you have uh, the last word. Yeah, I think that this is about really saying uh, for voters that you have the power to pass legislation and make your voice heard. And it also means that yes on 83, makes politicians work hard for your vote. They cannot just rely on getting the 20% every time. They have to get your second vote. You, they have to get your third vote. They have to work harder to talk to more people. And people are currently feeling like, I don't, I don't feel like my voice is heard in the system. And so I'm saying, well, let's have a better system that's a step in the right direction. It means that it means that letting independents vote in our taxpayer-funded elections expands the electorate and allowing for ranked choice voting, a proven system that has shown powerful results across the country is something where you can have a more choice and more voice in our current system. I, I encourage y'all to flip your ballots over to the back. Um, yes on 83 means yes on making politicians work harder for your vote. Um, and I also want to say that this is something that is being, um, there is excitement, there is energy on the ground. I don't know if my opponent has spoken to people on the ground, but we have done it for years. There is people ready for change. And that's why I keep saying that word, because people are ready for a better system that represents more of us that is being um, started and being, uh, you know, championed by people who are from DC. Thanks, Bree. And Deirdre, I'll leave you with the same question. Um, should Initiative 83 be enacted, what effect do you think it will have on either encouraging or discouraging voters to participate in our election? So, you know, I listen to me. You, as a voter, can make the decision for yourself. What tonight was about was uh, both sides being to present the information and getting out there. I have been on the ground and the whole reason we started this in January it was because we were hearing from people who were saying, I signed a petition, but I didn't know what I signed. They lied to me about what it was. How many of y'all signed a petition and knew exactly what you were signing? And we've been hearing that for months. So we said, okay, well, we need to educate the public, but we need to be official. So we registered with the Office of Campaign Finance. So we would become official and could go out and, and educate the public. All right. So you have to decide based on the facts you've heard here tonight. You can also go to our website and get even more information, whether or not you think this is good for you and your family and the people who look like you. I want you to also to please go out to talk to your neighbors, people at your church 
anyone you know and tell them to go to the Vote No 83 website or to go to any of these forums that we're having. Because the, what we're hearing is that a lot of people have their ballots on their dining room table, but they do not know what this is about. They don't know what ranked choice voting is, and they certainly don't know what semi-closed primaries is. Okay, And so we're out here just trying to educate the people. Lastly, I would just say that, listen, this is not a better system. What they are suggesting is bad election reform. And so I'm going to ask you once again, get the facts before you vote. Go to votenow83.com. Thank you. Thanks, Eugen. Thanks to both of our uh, speakers for this really robust conversation. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of information out there about this, and obviously a lot of it is conflicting and confusing. So I encourage, encourage everyone listening to go out and do their own research on this, uh, read some news articles, and uh, hopefully you'll be able to come to a decision when it's time to vote. But thank you for uh, letting me moderate this conversation. It was great to be a part of it. Uh, Caroline, I think I can kick it back to you now. Uh, but I really appreciated the opportunity to do this. Great. Let's give a virtual round of applause to our moderator, Michael Bryce Sadler. Did an excellent job, very ably mod moderating this forum. Thank you. Very informative. Uh, I also want to thank Bree McGowan and Deirdre Brown for their participation tonight and for educating us um, on, this very, on this important topic. And last but not, not least, I want to thank you, the audience who participated, for your conscientiousness in reaching out and, and seeking information on the topic, information that you need to cast an informed vote on this important topic. So thank you again. I want to screen share the, yeah. We're going to screen share here. The, the, this is uh, a couple of things uh, for more information. For more information on Brookland Civic, that there again is our website where we will be posting a, uh, 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 a recording of this event. Uh, more information on Initiative 83. We've got both the for and against websites there. Uh, even more information about either the uh, election schedule or um, registering to vote, te the legislative text of Initiative 83 at the Board of Elections web website. Uh, and, oh, and then the, the actual text of the leg legislation can be found at, at that site, also at the General Board of Elections website. Thank you, everybody, and uh, don't forget to vote. By November 5th. So Madam President, you're not taking uh, questions from the floor? I'm just asking in case someone did have a question. No. Let's just get on. Um.